And is there other biomarkers that are affected by it? Is it a, like it, Im, noticeable impacts on stuff like heart rate variability? Heart rate variability is dramatically impacted by your breathing patterns. This is the fascinating thing about everybody understand. Everybody thinks they know what heart rate variability is, but they don't understand that if they actually slow their breathing down, their heart rate variability will go up. And that's because as you take a breath in, you're pulling blood into the chest cavity and that increases venous return back to the heart and causes the heart to stretch more. And the, the increased stretch of the heart allows the heart to actually contract stronger because the bigger the stretch, the stronger the heart can contract. And then it doesn't need to take the next beat as big. So there's more variability between beats in the heart because of slow breathing. So the best way to improve your heart variability is to slow your breathing down. Yeah, I had Marco Altini on the podcast who's written some of the you know big papers on heart rate variability yeah. and he kind of went really deep on breathing and in particular the wrist-based devices that are so popular yes. on heart rate variability and how he thinks it's just a super bad way to measure it, that it needs to be a conscious moments we're measuring heart rate variability so we can control that breath because it has such a profound impact on the result it's interesting it, 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 he's totally right I, I don't disagree with him at all the the benefit of the of the wrist devices and i was actually talking to a, a non-athlete friend um just on the weekend uh who's an icu doctor and he's been tracking he has terrible sleep because he's up in the middle of the night taking care of patients who are sick and for that, and he does a week at a time of these horrible nights where he's taking care of patients all day, all night for seven days straight. And so for that whole week, his his sleep patterns are a disaster. He maybe sleeps two or three hours a night and then yeah. has a nap in the day to try and be functional because he's got to still function. But he, he's been tracking his heart rate variability because his watch tracks it. And while... He, well, and seeing he's right about what happens if you actually want a specific number to watch the trend is fascinating for this guy. His heart rate variability just drops through the week and his sleep scores are atrocious as well, obviously. But his heart rate variability tracks his sleep almost almost exactly the same. And his heart rate variability slowly recovers for the week after, gets to some normal level two or three weeks after his bad week of work. And then he's back at work again. And so you can you can actually track his fatigue and his cardiac fatigue from these terrible nights of sleep. Do you think we're at like, I'm thinking back when I got my first power meter, it was probably 2007, 2008, and almost nobody had a power meter then. You know, I've told this story a million times in the podcast of how expensive it was and, you know, telling my bank that it was a car to go to university and blowing the whole budget on a, a power meter. Do you think respiration respiratory analysis this whole field will become as popular as the parameter has become and where are we in that life cycle yeah as soon as we make it it's just like a, i would actually compare it more to a heart rate monitor where no nobody wore a heart rate monitor because it's impossible to measure heart you had to have six leads and it was all yeah. wires and stuff <laughs> and as soon as polar came up with a, a strap that you could put around and you could actually accurately measure your heart rate but everyone's like I should probably know what my heart rate is when I'm running. Now, every, I mean, nobody does, nobody rides a bike or runs without a heart rate monitor. They don't know how to use it. They, and, and most people don't use their heart rate. They just have it. They collect the data, but they don't actually use it. Uh, and uh, 20 years ago, we had a strap that incorporated breathing patterns as well as heart rate. It was called a um, before time where it was called a bio harness. Um, it was a New Zealand company. And we use that and because we were interested in how people breathe and so as soon as it, as soon as the heart rate straps start incorporating breathing patterns into it, and there are a number that are doing that now, Timeware is is one of those companies, um, but there's a number of companies doing it, and I, it's 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 not rocket science to measure how how big the chest is moving and how fat how often it's moving. So you can get the breathing patterns very quickly, and there are three or four companies um, that are doing that now, and I, I so. I think everybody would be looking at their breathing patterns in a few years because it'll just be part of what their heart rate straps show them. Um, and I think very similar to heart rate, there'll be a small number of people that use that data to direct their training and res and accurately use it. Or I think AI is going to help as well, but people are going to start seeing that there are changes that happen beneficially by a 
by adapting the training to what they see on their screen. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's l like they do with wattage, they should be doing it with, I think people should be doing it more with heart rate and with breathing because that's the physiologic change versus what the your power output is. On a, on a good day, if you can ride 300 watts, you'll have a different heart rate than you, than you will on a bad day. And those are two different physiologic effects. So the training needs to adapt to how your body is responding to it. Not it takes us a little bit of time even to catch up on the vocabulary on it because we're so used to, you know, LT1, LT2, that now to move to VT1, VT2, there's a new understanding and new vocabulary and new conversations that have to happen. And maybe like the carbohydrate movement has had in the last few years since Sam Impey's Fuel for the Work Required paper, it's been this slow movement towards actually fueling the demands of the work now yeah. to the point where people don't realize that sometimes they're inhibiting their performance because they just keep pushing more and more carbohydrates. Like I'm talking to guys who are doing 200 grams of carbohydrates per hour. And then I talk to a physiologist for a tutor, Podlicar, and he explained it to me with a lovely analogy. It's like when you're coming off the toll boot and there's like 14 toll boots and they all merge into two lanes of traffic. It's like there's a backlog. And that's exactly what happens when we go too heavy on carbohydrate. Absolutely. intake and i think it's a lot of this stuff just needs time to play out and us to have those conversations for it to become into common usage and parlance absolutely i i i totally i totally agree and and companies like time where make are making it more accessible and as soon as they make it a, a affordable and easy to use is exactly our our whole argument from the beginning and that's why our the device that we use to help people train is is quite inexpensive because it's it really is a partly a teaching tool and partly a training tool but the idea was to make it affordable enough that anybody can use it to to help adapt and help understand their breathing so that they can incorporate it into their into their regular lives and not take not take hours and hours and hours to do, to do what they will benefit them in the short term but also in in the long term because Breathing health is a big part of this too, and and helping people breathe better is uh, the the physiologic effects of longevity. Every, there's a ton of studies that come out this like, this year talking about VO2 as being the best predictor for longevity. A sub study of that showed that the ventilation, how you breathe, was had even a greater prediction of longevity, which is which is a fascinating. So how much you can breathe the total volume of breath that you can move. And that comes down to two things, how big your respiratory system is and how fast you can move it, the coordination of it. Because I often wonder what those VO2 recommendations to give, like, oh, the higher your VO2, the longer you're going to live. But like, I am even think about myself, like you can game that VO2 system super easy because it's so, it's so predicated on body weight. Like I'm a much healthier person at 80 kilograms than I am at 68 yeah. kilograms. My yeah. VO2 max looks very, very different at 68 kilograms and 80 kilograms. Yeah, most people, uh, most scientists will not use a weight-based VO2. They'll use an they'll use an absolute total. VO2. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. They'll use they'll use as, as mils of oxygen per minute, and they'll they'll remove the kilograms from it. So most of those studies are being published not per kilogram, but they're just doing it total volume. But you're right. Your your VO2. If you're healthy at 80 kilograms, healthier at 80 kilograms than you were at 68, your VO2 is likely higher. Total. total. Yeah. Yeah. But you would you would have you would have had a more impressive number if you developed by your kilograms when you were lighter. But your absolute but your absolute VO2 would be better if you have stayed healthy. And you yeah, it's can. Like, it's like your wattage, and like I can probably put out more wattage now than ever. But what's per right. kilogram? A <laughs> very <Yeah>. different equation. <laughs> Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. I and and I think we were talking just before the podcast about. I, I had the opportunity to ride with Sven Tuff the other day, who's a big boy. I mean, he's. I mean, he's famous for sitting on the front of a peloton for two hundred k and just pulling it along at four hundred watt. I mean, the guy is an absolute incredible. But we were climbing up a hill, and I mean, he, he's, he hasn't lost a lot. I mean, yeah, he's lost a lot compared to his pro days, but he is an unbelievable physiologic beast to be able to ride up the hills that we were riding up. We were riding up gravel climbs at 20% and uh, it took everything I, my power to keep my wheels on the ground. And he was just pedaling beside me like it was, and he must've been doing 500 Watts. 
That's what you get when you tow your dog on a trailer all over the country on the bike races for half a decade. Yeah, a big dog too. It wasn't it wasn't a little dog. And there's there's no places in BC where there's flat roads. There's all mountains around here. Andrew, I know you're a super busy in demand guy, so I really do appreciate your time and just shedding some light on this, which I think is a fascinating area. And I think, you know, if you're up for it, we'll we'll go on part two and part three on this in the weeks and months to come because I think it's there's a tailwind behind this breeding respiratory area at the moment. And I think it's just gonna you know, I think the com- like these conversations are important to just start chipping away at the layers and getting deeper and deeper and more nuanced each time. Absolute pleasure. I, uh, it was really nice to meet you and uh, thank you very much for having me on. What do the Jure d'Italia stage slayer Mads Pedersen and half the professional peloton have in common? Well, they're all turning to Nomeo, the natural performance enhancer proven to reduce lactate buildup during intense efforts. In the 2025 Jure d'Italia, Pedersen's form was undeniable. The Danish star surged to four stage victories. This was a major leap in form from his previous season and a key part of this preparation and performance was Nomeo. Developed by the same researchers who discovered the performance power of diet nitrate. You know those beetroot shots that half the peloton were using? Nomeo is clinically proven to lower lactate levels, reduce oxidative stress, improve training adaptations, and deliver a noticeable boost from the very first time you take it. Riders are reporting bigger threshold power, fresher legs mid-race, and quicker recovery, all from a formula made with just three natural ingredients. Broccoli sprouts, lemon, and sugar. Whether you're racing at the front or you're smashing local segments, Nomeo helps you get more out of every ride. Take it before key sessions or races for an immediate edge or take your training to the next level and get more out of your hard work. Go to drinknomeo.com that's N-O-M-I-O and check out this game-changing supplement. Details are in the episode show notes or description down below.